So my talk is, is called, What Does Pakistan Have to Do with Haiti? Because for a year, I've been trying to get my head around the weird coincidence that the two countries that matter most deeply and personally to me were both devastated in 2010 by horrific natural disasters, the earthquake in Haiti and the severe flooding in Pakistan. I wonder what the meaning of that might be. Of course, events don't have inherent meaning, and certainly coincidences don't. They just happen. They just are. So where can I go to find meaning, if I must? What, if anything, do pa Haiti and Pakistan have to do with each other? If a picture is worth a thousand words, then I hope that the two pictures I've just shown give a sense of what I see as the most important connection. As a friend of mine put it years ago, Haiti is a place for big questions. I've been trying to understand it for nearly 30 years, and its politics, history, and culture have many twists and turns that are still opaque to me. But one thing I know is that anything that's true of Haiti is true of the world as a whole. And that's a truth that's not complicated at all, only hard to swallow. We deny it because it's less painful in the short term to avert our eyes. As Tracy Kidder, the author of the celebrated bestseller about Dr. Paul Farmer, Mountains Beyond Mountains, once said to me, I've learned so much about the world from Haiti, some of which I almost wish I hadn't learned. To me, Haiti feels like home because I was 16 years old the first time I went there. My early experience of Haiti informed my later responses to very different countries, particularly during the five years in, I lived in Asia in the 1990s. I saw chronically desperate Cambodia and tortured Burma and deforested Thailand with the eyes of someone who had seen Haiti. In my work these days, I meet and speak to Pakistanis routinely, both in Pakistan and around the United States. One question they never fail to ask me is, why did you first go to Pakistan? It's a very understandable question, and it's one that I've never been able to find an adequate answer to. Why Pakistan? Why did I go in there in the first place? And why do I keep continue going back? I often respond by quoting John Lennon, life is what happens to you while you're busy making other plans. But hovering implicit behind the question is the history and atmosphere of mutual suspicion between Pakistan and the United States. Why would you come here? Why are you really here? I often find myself teasing this suspicion into the open by jokingly telling them that I'm with the CIA. But the truth is that I really am an unaffiliated private citizen who first went to Pakistan in 1995 out of personal curiosity, eagerness to learn, and a search for adventure, as Todd alluded in his, in his great introduction. My reason now for continuing to return is more considered. I feel a responsibility to continue writing and speaking about the Pakistan that I know. The Pakistan I know is very far from perfect, but nor is it the Pakistan that you see on TV. Todd Shea, whom you'll hear from later today, likes to say that the American public hears 2% of the story about Pakistan 100% of the time. I'm sorry for stealing your line, Todd. <laughs> Pakistan is a, is a real place with real complexities, populated by 170 million real human beings, some 40% of whom are below the age of 15. Consider that for a moment. For at least 40% of Pakistanis who are alive today were small children or toddlers or not born yet when the World Trade Center was, was attacked in 2001. Both countries, Pakistan and Haiti, are prime examples of what the Nigerian novelist Chimamanda Adichie in an excellent TED talk in 2009 called the danger of a single story. We Americans tell ourselves a single story about Haiti and we tell ourselves a different single story about Pakistan. Paul Farmer titled one of his books, The Uses of Haiti. We use Haiti rhetorically and ideologically, and every time there's a new fitful spasm of American interest in Haiti, our uses for it rear their heads anew. It's never an edifying thing to see, and for those of us who know Haiti, it's maddening. Something else that connects Haitians and Pakistanis is their experience as immigrants and visitors to this country. Friends of Haiti know Edwige Dantika 
as a wonderfully sensitive, eloquent Haitian American novelist. I admire Danteca's novels, but the book of hers that I consider a masterpiece is her nonfiction memoir, Brother I'm Dying. It tells the story of her 81 year old uncle who helped raise her, who fled violence in his Port au Prince neighborhood in 2004 and made the mistake of asking for political asylum at the airport in Miami. U.S. immigration officials threw him into the infamous Chrome Detention Center and denied him his diabetes medication, and he died in detention. Dantica's anger is controlled and highly disciplined in the book, and her book is above all a beautifully composed story about family love, immigrant struggle and aspiration, and the tortured and all too intimate relationship between Haiti and the United States, told by a Haitian who's also an American. I often find myself telling Pakistanis the story of Edwij Dantika's uncle to help reassure them that they're not alone. I've heard many Pakistanis U.S. immigration stories privately, and many of them prefer to keep their stories private. But there's one story that I'd like to share with you today. This March, three months ago, in the city of Multan in Pakistan's Punjab province, a wonderful family hosted me and, me and photographer Pete Sabo, a friend of mine from Seattle who travels with me. The head of the family that hosted us is a physician who runs his own hospital and is a very warm, generous, and dignified man. I found him a master of the art of hospitality, which is to say not only did he make Pete and me feel extremely welcome, he also refrained from embarrassing us by associating us with our country's government. He embraced and honored us as brothers. But right at the end of our days in Multan, immediately before taking us to the bus station, he told me a story. I'm convinced that his timing was no accident, and I feel both an honor and a burden uh, to share the story uh, with other Americans. Several years ago, the doctor told me, he traveled to Seattle to attend his nephew's wedding. Twelve days later, he went to the Seattle airport to return to Pakistan. He was leaving the United States, mind you. An immigration or TSA official, he described her to me as a very large lady, asked why he had spent only 12 days in America. He explained to her that he was a doctor and that he had to return to his patients in his hospital. She replied, I don't think you're a doctor. I think you're a terrorist. She made him strip to his underwear, and the interrogation continued in the same vein for about 45 minutes. He conveyed the, all this to me in a quiet tone and with great dignity as we walked to his car. It was, very, it was especially moving to be told this story in the tone in which he told me. He, he, wasn't ang he wasn't conveying anger. He was simply telling the story. As we walked to his car after visiting Multan's famous Sufi shrines, which incidentally very depressingly are now surrounded by razor wire and guard towers against anticipated terrorist attacks. T Pakistanis are much closer to any possible terrorism uh, that happens in our world than you and I are here in Princeton. He ended the story by telling me that when the woman finally let him dress and run to catch his flight, in that moment he decided that he would never again visit America. Pakistanis and Haitians have in common that they both see the United States from outside. And what they see is often ugly and cruel because they live on the receiving end of the American power that we don't experience because we're the ones who wield it. Haitian proverbs are highly distilled gems of wisdom honed over centuries of hard experience. One of my favorites is Baiku Blie Porte Mak Songe. It translates as he who gives the blow forgets. He who bears the bruise remembers. Pakistanis I share it with always nod with understanding and recognition. Another connection is the recent disasters themselves. After the Haitian earthquake, many Pakistani friends of mine responded immediately and with real sympathy concretely expressed. Pakistanis remembered their own earthquake of October 8, 2005, which killed 80,000 people. Hundreds of Pakistani physicians from the Islamic Medical Association of North America volunteered in Haiti after the earthquake there. 
I'm afraid that American society missed the opportunity to show similar human concern for Pakistanis half a year later, when 20% of Pakistan was underwater. I wrote an article then called Pakistan Floods, Why Should We Care? which was published on the Huffington Post and on my own website, ethancasey.com. An email from Uzma Shah, a Pakistani physician in Boston, was typical of the many responses I received to that article. It's hard to see pictures from Pakistan, Uzma wrote, and I can't help but choke back tears when I see all that desperation. And amidst all the furor about all things bad and hard about Pakistan and Islam, it's comforting to read your article because at the end of the day, we are all human, living in one world, sharing the same life. It's easy to explain our failure, to explain our failure to ourselves, to, to explain our failure to respond adequately to the floods. It's easy to explain things that we, that we want to explain to ourselves. Americans suffered from con compassion fatigue after Haiti. Pakistan is farther away. A flood is a slow-moving disaster whose effects are less immediately dramatic than an earthquake. But it's hard to avoid facing the effects of a decade-long national climate that has made Muslims the only group in America against whom it's permissible, even fashionable, to be bigoted. And in truth, I'm also disturbed by our response to Haiti, which could be described as self-indulgent overkill. Half of American households gave to Haiti, as we tend to say. But there are real questions about whether that avalanche of money and sympathy did much real good. What I saw on the ground in Haiti last August and September was, the most, was that most international aid was still concentrated in Port-au-Prince, which explains the demoralizing tent cities and their persistence still now. Why hasn't the aid effort been directed more toward productive work for poor Haitians and in the provinces rather than in the capital? Haitians understand the need. The buzzword among them has been decentralization. But most of the money and power remains in the hands of the international institutions that just want to get their logos on national TV, as a Haitian friend of mine cynically puts it. And here's my other question. Those people that we cared so deeply about in early 2010, who are they? And what are they all about? Haitians are more and other than charity cases. They're human beings with a culture and a politics and a national history that's closely intertwined with our own. And like Pakistanis, Haitians are incredibly resourceful people because they have to be. We owe it to them and to ourselves to know them. Of course, it takes much longer than 18 minutes to know people properly. I've been getting to know Haitians for 30 years and Pakistanis for 16, and it's this ongoing human education that I try to share with readers of my books. Just as I returned to Haiti last summer, I returned to Pakistan for three weeks in February and March of this year. Pete Sabo and I visited three flood-affected areas, the Swat Valley, the agricultural breadbasket of the central Punjab along the Indus River, and an area dominated by the Baloch ethnic minority in the far south southwestern corner of Punjab province. In Swat, we saw a valley floor shockingly denuded of all topsoil. In the Punjab, we saw brick and mud villages that were only just starting to be rebuilt, mostly by the devastated local people themselves. And we heard complaints of incomplete and feckless responses from the provincial and national governments, and of international NGOs obtusely continuing to give food aid when what people now needed urgently was paid employment helping rebuild the dikes, the damaged dikes along the Indus and the whole Indus system to control the, this coming summer's monsoon season floods. As in Haiti, there was a depressing sense that no one in particular was in charge and that there was no overall plan. I spent a couple of months on several trips to Haiti between July and November 2004. That, that was an especially, that was a long time before the earthquake. But it was an especially difficult time for Haiti and Haitians. 
following the second forced departure of President Jean-Bertrand Aristide that February. Regardless of what you think of Aristide himself, I would refer who, anyone who isn't sure whether that event was a US-sponsored coup d'etat, sponsored by the Bush administration, to Paul Farmer's article, Who Removed Aristide, published in the a April 15, 2004 issue of the London Review of Books. Farmer told me that he, re he removed from that article anything that he couldn't buttress with 70 pages of footnotes. I came and went between Haiti and Miami several times in 2004. I like Miami, partly exactly because it's so brazenly a third world city. But in 2004, I found Miami maddening. One well-intentioned wealthy woman I met there asked me, as we sat beside her swimming pool, how I had found Haiti. I told her the truth. I'm not sure the truth is what she wanted to hear. She didn't know what to say, so she said, you stayed in good hotels though, right? I also visited Miami's public radio station, where I played for the station manager part of a mini disc recording I had made during a demonstration in Port-au-Prince. I translated for him what one demonstrator had told me. He's saying that they don't want the Brazil football team to come to Haiti unless Aristide returns, I told him. The demonstrators objected to the leading role Brazil was playing in the international community's military and diplomatic response to the situation in Haiti since, the, since uh, Aristide's ouster. You could agree or disagree with them, but their position was easy to understand. But the station manager was incredulous. What does one have to do with the other? He asked in exasperation. I thought, if you don't know or can't guess, then you've got no business running a public radio station in Miami. I didn't say that to him, but I thought it. He declined to use my, my material. I share that anecdote because I want to highlight the jarring disjunction between journalism as it's usually practiced in the US and what I believe journalism should be and do. This is an important subject because of the implications for how Americans perceive the world beyond our shores. To me, the way American habits of mind are reflected in the culture of American publishing is personified in the New York literary agent who asked me when I told him I had published a book on Pakistan, what's your argument? I was so nonplussed by the question that I could scarcely blurt out the answer. The answer is that I'm not making an argument. I'm telling a story. If I have an argument, it's implicit. My books are first-person travel narratives, not only because that's the kind of book I'm able and willing to write, but also because that's the kind of book that rarely gets written about Pakistan in particular. And it's a kind of book that I feel that country needs and deserves. We need, first of all, to know and understand the humanity of, of, of other people. The Daily Telegraph's reviewer was both kind and correct, uh, as, to, as Todd referred uh, at the beginning in his introduction when he um, Describe my book Alive and Well in Pakistan by saying that the author's true journey is a search for common humanity. Needless to say, I feel the same way about Haiti. This is me in Haiti in 1982. The connection between Haiti and Pakistan that I want to leave you with is that we Americans reduce each to a single story and that we're very wrong to do so. Our lazy and self-comforting reductionism says nothing of nothing about Haiti or Pakistan, and all too much about us. The earthquake in Haiti and the floods in Pakistan were natural disasters, but they didn't happen in a geopolitical vacuum. And they give us occasion to learn and to exercise our imagination and human sympathy. God made us all the same God, made us all tribes and nations so that we may know one another. Thank you. <laughs>